This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, now accepting pre-orders for the all-new Ledger Blue Developer Edition, a Bluetooth and NFC touchscreen hardware signing device. Learn more about the Ledger Blue at ledgerwallet.com and use the discount code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. And by the GTEC Blockchain Contest. If you have an idea for a blockchain-related project, make sure you apply for your chance to win awards worth 50,000 euros. Go to epicenterbitcoin.com slash gtech, that's G-T-E-C, to learn more about GTEC and how you can apply. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we have a very... We have a slightly offbeat topic for our listeners. Most of you must have heard uh, of the problem with oracles, the fundamental problem of how we can put financial data in in trustless blockchains. And it turns out there's a very interesting uh, solution to the problem of oracles, but it it depends on a technology called TLS Notary. So we are going to interview Adam Gibson from the TLS Notary project about what TLS Notary is and what are the kinds of applications with blockchains. They are very interesting. So let's uh, so do do check out the application section. But before that, let's have an introduction from Adam. Adam, a bit about your background, please. Hi. Yeah. So um, I got interested in Bitcoin um, probably late 2012, early 2013, and uh, very rapidly after that became interested in the this kind of. Uh, uh, mythical beast, the decentralized exchange of fiat to Bitcoin, which you know, arguably can't exist, but there was endless debates about it back then. Um, also, perhaps you want to know a little bit about my background, but uh, I, I, I'm maths and physics is my training, but I've been a teacher, a software engineer, and so on. But anyway, so to come back to this topic of uh, how, how I got interested in this, uh, so starting around May 2013, uh, myself and another guy online called uh, Dan Smith, um, and uh, well, it was us two originally, um, started looking f- for ways in which we could use uh, SSL slash TLS uh, as a possible cryptographic solution to that problem of fiat Bitcoin uh, exchange. And another guy uh, whose online handle is Oak Pacific kind of joined us a few months later, and we've been working on it a long time. and, and at some time around mid-2015, I guess you could say, we, we kind of finished in a sense that we now have what is now called TLS Notary. And we found that, uh, as you just mentioned, it could be applied in a, a number of other contexts as well, uh, based around this idea of using a, a cryptographic proof of a, of a web page, let's say. So c- could you explain uh, very briefly what the big picture concept behind TLS Notary is, what it allows it to do? Sure. So I thought maybe I could give a a simple example, a practical example, where it might apply. Um, Something that that struck me uh, maybe one or two years ago um, here in Latvia, where I live, is that I had to go to a government office to uh, provide proof of my um, uh, income or or savings. So I had to provide a a financial proof. Um, And as is often the case in this kind of situation, you know, you go to the government office and they've got a very old kind of bureaucracy and they want some kind of form or, or piece of paper to prove something. So I, what I did was I simply uh, printed out, I think it might have been a PDF or an HTML page from my internet banking, uh, printed it on paper, took it into the, the government office and the guy looked at it and sort of nodded his head and said, yeah, this is obviously correct, right? So obviously you have got that money or that uh, income or whatever. Uh, and obviously that's ridiculous because anyone can print anything they like on paper with any kind of letterhead. Uh, so that's an example where it would be useful to have a digital signature, right? Because the, the, that's the main application of a digital signature is that um, somebody can have a public key out there in the world and it can be used to attest to the fact that they actually made this statement. So that's called a non-repudiable um, statement in the sense that as long as the public key of that uh, organization is known, then if the signature verifies against that public key, it's cryptographic proof. Now, uh, there aren't many of, it's surprising in a way, I mean, it might be surprising or it might not, that there are many um, big public institutions, whether they be banks or government uh, offices, that don't actually provide digital signatures for the various statements that they you know, attest to for their citizens or customers. 
Um, so in a way, TLS notary is an, I an idea where we're trying to sort of fill that gap of situations where digital signatures are not being provided, but yet you still want cryptographic proof that a certain authority um, uh, gave you uh, that statement. Um, so yeah. <laughs> I'll stop there. Yeah, uh, and uh, I find that such a telling example. Uh, I'll give you a bit of uh, a, bit, uh, a little story. When I when I talk about blockchains to really just people that have no idea, I often use this very type of example of taking paper, taking information coming from one database, which is say your bank or your um, maybe perhaps your landlord giving you like proof of residency and uh, a government office, which it where there's inputs of data, and you're essentially the transport layer and the trusted party to make sure that all the information coming from one set of data, one one output databases, essentially, and going into the other, while well, you're the trusted uh, third party to verify those, and also the transport layer. So basically, you're playing the role of an API between like, the various. <laughs> Outputs of data, uh, like you know your bank, uh, you know your mm -hmm. landlord, maybe like the tax office and stuff like that, and bringing it over to some lady behind a desk and, and a glass window, <laughs> who, who then does risk H analysis. Human API, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the, the risk analysis, and then allows you to stay in a country for another year. And since I stay live in France, I I'm confronted with this type of example like all the time. So uh, that's that's a really interesting example, and I guess TLS uh, TLS notary is a much simpler uh, way of being able to prove outputs of data from one system and being able to bring it into another. Uh, I guess where blockchains might make, the, where blockchains might come in handy there is providing a transport layer um, that would effectively just allow both entities to, to share pieces of data uh, and, and have trust in, in, that, in, in the data that's provided. Um, so yeah, just a little, uh, Little aside there, uh, but but I really like that example. Like, so let's um, let's perhaps talk about uh, TLS uh, because I, I mean for me personally, I you know, excuse excuse me, but I <laughs> I work in web technologies, and for some reason I still thought we were using SSL. I don't know why. I mean we talk about SSL certificates pretty uh, yeah, pretty much absolutely. all the time. Absolutely. And I was so surprised when I started really digging into what TLS and SSL was that actually SSL yeah. doesn't exist anymore since like <laughs> the early 2000s. Oh, it, it, does, it does exist, but... Uh, yeah. Right, but it's not the right uh, not way used, to call yeah. it. Yeah. So um, let's, uh, could you explain you know, in, in, a, in, a, in simple terms what uh, TLS is and what it allows to do essentially? Because uh, we use it all the time. Right, okay. So first let's briefly d deal with that SSL TLS confusion for those who still have a confusion about it. Um, just think of SSL as the old version of TLS. They're actually the same technology. TLS 1.0 is, in a sense, SSL 4.0. Um, now, uh, what is TLS? So the basic idea is you want to talk... Uh, it's, it's really a way of using public key cryptography to enable uh, encrypted communications between clients and servers. It's very much designed in that client-server model. So obviously the web server is what we're talking about here. And uh, the, the problem is that you, you want to provide not just encryption. Well, let, let's put it this way. You don't just want the data being transferred between the client and the server to be confidential, but you also want it to be uh, authenticate, authenticated and have integrity. So um, let's, let's just go through like a high, very high level picture of what TLS does for those who don't know. So you start with the client uh, generating some secret data. This is going to be like the, the key or keys for the session. And then he wraps up that secret data uh, in using public key encryption. So that's something I think most people know what that means. I'll assume you do. So he's encrypted the, the secret data and he's sent it to the server. And the public key he's encrypted it to is, um, let's say in crude terms, is the certificate of the web server. Um, actually, it's like the public key is signed by a certificate authority. But let's just say, right? So the client sends the secret data to the web server encrypted so that only he, the client, and the web server know that secret data. Then when they both have that secret data, what they do is they kind of munge it up a little bit, 
and they generate a, a string of bytes. And they're both doing that same generation on both sides. So they both generate the same bytes. And then they chop those bytes up into sections. And they use each of those sections of bytes as keys for the encryption process that they're going to do when, they, you know, when the client says his get request and the, and the web server sends back his HTML page or whatever. They're going to be using some encryption keys. Now, you might ask, well, why didn't they just use the public key encryption at the beginning to send the get request? Well, the main answer is that public key encryption is slower, um, both in you know, encrypt and decrypt operations and signing operations and so on. So you, you want to use what we call symmetric encryption for the actual data transfer. Uh, symmetric encryption is just where the encryption and the decryption key are the same. So if, if, I, if I can yeah. just uh, sort of recap, uh, you're using uh, public private key encryption to send the initial piece of data that will allow you to yeah. generate these symmetric keys that then, then we are used for uh, encoding and decoding messages. That's right. And I should probably mention at this point that that, that bit of data, that secret data you send at the start is called the pre-master secret because we're going we're to refer to that later. Um, the other thing to bear in mind at this stage is that it's not just the uh, encryption decryption keys we need. It's also something called a MAC key. And MAC here means message authentication code. And the reason we need a, a message authentication code is to come back to what I said at the beginning. We don't just provide confidentiality. We just don't just say, oh, it's enough that the somebody sniffing the wire can't read the data. We also don't want them to be able to modify it. Because if they can modify it, there's a whole set of very clever attacks they can do, which can really screw things up. So what we do is we append a MAC, which you could think of like a checksum or like a hash, to the end of each block of data that's get, getting sent between the two parties. And that MAC is actually generated from something called HMAC. And so HMAC is a hash function. That's something I think most people listening to this would be familiar with. Uh, HMAC is a hash function, but it's keyed. So instead of saying, suppose the data is hello. Instead of uh, sending the hash of hello, we send the hash of 1234 hello, where 1234 is the secret MAC key. And what that means is that the only person who could generate that HMAC is the person who had that secret 1234. It's not enough to know the data. You have to know the secret key too. So because only the server has the HMAC key, the client knows that when he receives a block of encrypted data with this HMAC, he knows it came from the server. So, so just to summarize, what would we say? We said public key encryption to send the secret across, then symmetric encryption to send data back and forth, and the data is authenticated using HMACs at the end of each block, which function like uh, checksums. That's, that's a really great explanation. And, 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 uh, and the reason you use symmetric encryption to recap is because public key encryption is expensive and you don't want to use it for every piece of communication you send over the wire. That's right, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Now, now, in essence, like had public key encryption being used to send each block of data over the, over the internet, then uh, suppose when I connect to my bank, the bank is also sending me the data about my balance and it is signing with its, with like its private key. And anyone else can verify that uh, this data that the bank sent me. Well, well, be careful because because there's different things here, right? There's public key encryption and, and public key signing. So, um, first of all, if we were to do the whole process with public key in, uh, public key systems only, we would need um, a public key for, from both sides. Now, actually, uh, SSL slash TLS does provide client side certificates. So, a client can send a certificate to a server if they want to authenticate themselves. But it, it's interesting that almost nobody uses that system in real life, because we want the client to be ultra lightweight. Uh, stateless, just the client just comes along, pings, goes away. That's it. Clients e even anonymous in some cases. Of course, not if you have a login, but that's, that's another matter. And also, um, the other one, point I wanted to make on that is, yeah, it could be that the server could be sending signatures with each block of data. Uh, and in fact, uh, Sergio Lerner made a, a similar suggestion to that on the TLS working group uh, um, email list, uh, maybe last year sometime. But, uh, you know, the question is, do do people, like, do people from the server side actually want that? Because it's, it's kind of heavy. Do they want to provide non-repudiable, so to remind you the case of when I'm at the, the office, I wanted you know, a non-repudiable signature that nobody could say afterwards, oh, that wasn't me, right? Do, do servers actually want to provide non-repudiable signatures on every single block of data they send to their clients? I don't know. It's a complicated question. In some cases, they might. In some cases, they might not.
Let's take a short break so we can go to Paris. I stopped into La Maison du Bitcoin, situated in the heart of Paris's startup scene, and I met with Eric Larchevêque, Ledger CEO, to talk about the Ledger Nano. The Ledger Nano is a Bitcoin hardware wallet based on a secure element. It is on a USB form factor that you plug directly inside your computer and it will manage all your private keys. The signature of transactions will be done inside the secure element, thus never revealing the private keys to the host computer. It is compatible with our own Ledger Wallet Chrome app, which you can also use for multi-signature with Copay or CoinKite, and a large range of third-party applications such as Mycelium, Electrum, GreenBits, Green Address, and so on. The Nano also exists as a cool bracelet wearable, so you can always wear proudly your Bitcoins on your wrist. The Ledger Nano is an easy to use hardware storage option, which doesn't compromise on security. If you want to get a secure setup for storing your Bitcoins, go to ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER Bitcoin. So in essence, today we are in a state where we are receiving data from various different servers, but uh, once, say, I receive data from, from some, some server, maybe it's a government server, I can look at the data, and I can look at the properties of data, but I can't take that data to you and convince you that this is true. For example, I'll receive something from a government server that I was born in, I don't know, 1985. So I, I can be convinced of that data, but if I it's not possible for me to go to you and convince you that I was actually born in 85 and that the government told has certified this because our uh, government hasn't actually signed that statement using using its private key. Exactly, exactly. What happened was uh, you and the, and the government website uh, were using a, a, a kind of repudiable signature. HMAC is like a signature, but it's repudiable because, it, because although you know it's real, if you give it to me, I'm going to look at it and say, right, what, what were the keys for this for this session? You, you give me the encryption keys and the HMAC keys, right? I can decrypt it. That, that seems to work. Right, the HMAC, HMACs seem to check. And then I'll say, well, but hang on. Uh, how do I know you didn't just create all of this data, all the keys, all the web page, the whole thing, just out of, out of whole cloth? And the only way you could answer that is if you could prove to me what the, the, the secret keys were that were used in the session. But they were encrypted to the to the government website's private key. So I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's some weird way you could get the government involved to prove that it was real. But then that's kind of begging the question because then you're asking the government anyway. <laughs> so it, so the data is reputable, yeah. So it's between the two parties, the client server. Everything's absolutely kosher, cryptographically speaking. But as far as anyone else is concerned, it could all just be made up. And so just before we go a bit deeper into TLS notary specifically, can you talk about some of the vulnerabilities that uh, TLS specifically can can fall subject to? Well, um, wow, that's that's a kind of a huge topic, right? I, mean, I, I, I suppose there are many, but what are the, some of the most common ones uh, that well, we a, see a lot of the a lot of the ones that, that have popped up over the last few years, and maybe even going back to sort of two thousand when, when when TLS one started. Um, are to do that. There's a couple of different classes of, of problems. One of them is related to export cipher suites, uh, and this is all about the fact that the U.S. government actually wanted it to be weak. <laughs> so there were there were all these kind of legacy systems or legacy, let's say, elements of the protocol that used slightly weaker encryption standards in them, and 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 and, and there've been attacks based on fallbacks because you have to kind of negotiate which version you're going to use. So that's that's one class. Uh, another class is what's sometimes called padding oracle attacks, which is where you because of the, the kind of standardization of the format, uh, if, if it's possible to kind of ping the server a lot of times, look at the, the encrypted data, and you can kind of um, slowly but surely glean individual bits of information. But the, those padding oracle attacks, they got a lot of kind of coverage, but I think in practice they weren't very realistic because... Maybe I shouldn't say that, but it just seems that way to me because you, you, a lot of them involved actually pinging servers like a million times. <laughs> um, there, there, uh, I'm trying to think of the other ones. That, there are a whole, whole, oh yeah, the, the other whole sort of area of attack, I think, has been based around extensions to the protocol because being like any protocol sort of designed by committee, it has lots of different bits and pieces that get tacked on. 
Um, for example, I think the Heartbleed uh, vulnerability that got a lot of play, for very good reason, because it was a very serious vulnerability, was based on DTLS, which was this kind of... Um, I actually forget now what was DTLS about. But anyway, it was an extension to the protocol. It wasn't the core protocol. Uh, so, but that is a huge topic, and I, I, I can't class myself <laughs> sufficiently expert to give you a talk about that, I'm afraid. Right, okay. No, but that's uh, it's interesting. And, and I, I suppose also some higher-level problems are related to certif certificate authorities. and Oh, of course, have, yeah. You know, that whole... That whole uh, can, can you give just sort of a, a sort of brief uh, explanation of what, uh, what that problem looks like? Oh, well, the way I see it, I mean, maybe other people don't agree with me, is that the certificate authority model is just appalling. I mean, it's a terrible idea, right? Because you have the incredibly centralized um, entities that uh, are farming out certificates and effectively giving, um, you know, being in charge of deciding who is actually who uh, on the internet. But it depends what you mean, really. If you mean what are the kind of... Um, cryptographic vulnerabilities in it or, or what are the kind of systemic vulnerabilities in it because I mean I, my, my experience is on my browser I go and I look at the list of CAs and I see you know 20 not 20 maybe 200 different certificate authorities from all around the world I have no trust in them whatsoever I've actually gone and deleted a lot of them from my browser because I don't I know I don't need them but any one of them just have it have happening to uh, have some systemic failure within their company or, or, or whatever could result in you, you know, thinking you're logging onto your bank when you're logging onto a hacker's website. So, uh, at one level, you can see it's pretty. And yet, and yet, I must say, of course, in reality, that is the system that works. That is the system that brought, brought public key cryptography to the world. It, it, it isn't being used outside of that. I mean, nobody's using GPG, you know. <laughs> so it swings and roundabouts, I guess. That was a really good introduction to, to TLS Notary, which is basically a communication protocol on top of uh, top of the web. Uh, TLS, you mean, not TLS, TLS Notary. Oh, sorry, TLS, <laughs> not TLS Notary. Now, uh, what TLS Notary do, is doing is it's kind of extending TLS in order to make uh, communications verifiable. So when Meher communicates with Adam, mm -hmm. Meher gets the ability with TLS Notary to prove to Sebastian that it did receive something coming from Adam, that he did receive something coming from Adam, right? So uh, just walk us through like how, how TLS notaries are able to achieve this. All right. So uh, earlier we were discussing the scenario where, um, let's say, you got a web page from your government and uh, it was all correct and you gave it to me. And I said, well, hang on. Um, how, do you, how do I know this is real? You could have made up the web page, right? You could have, but in, in order to, if you wanted to generate the whole kind of network traffic, you would have had to generate like network packets or, well, TLS records, let's put it at that level. You would have had to generate a series of TLS records that were encrypted and had HMACs on them, just as I described earlier. And you would have had to give it to me, and I, I could have looked at it and I, and I would have said, right, I need the keys, you give me the keys, and then my problem is, how do I know those keys are real? Yeah? So, um, how about this as a proposed alternative in order to achieve what you just said? How about, um, and what was I thinking? Oh yeah, so suppose, so in the scenario you described, I think you had Sebastian as the auditor and you as the client and me as the server. Let's just call them auditor, the person who wants to check it, client and server, like normal client server, yeah? Just keep the names clear, all right. So um, how about this scenario? The auditor generates um, the what I called before the pre-master secret, which means that effectively he's generating all the secret keys. He's generating the secret data. He's giving it to the auditor, gives it to the client. The client then sets up a normal TLS connection with the server, does the business, a uh, page comes back, and then the client gives the page to the auditor. That, that should work, right? The auditor is then gets proof that the data is real, yeah? Yeah, yeah, the auditor gets the proof because he has generated the secret and the client used the auditor's generated secret for the communication. Absolutely. But then that also opens up the client to being defrauded by the auditor. Very is, good, is, okay. Is, is, is that the case? <laughs> Why? Um, because the client has to trust the auditor completely in order to generate the secret. Yeah, it's not obvious, but it is true, <laughs> what you're saying. <clears throat> Think about the, I don't know if you've ever heard the, the phrase man in the middle. Have you heard that phrase? 
Yes, but but let's let's have an explanation of that then. <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 actually an interesting discussion. We had this discussion early on. Um, I, I guess it was late 2013, early 2014. We had this discussion in when, when we were working on it, because yeah, you could do it like that. And um, for example, you you could. Well, anyway, let's just explain man in the middle. Yeah. So he, the auditor has all the secrets. So what that means is the auditor can step between the client and the server and can um, uh, he can modify the traffic he can send because he knows the the, the, the secrets uh, you know what I should at this stage explain the separation of the secrets so I said earlier there's a pre-master secret it gets split into four or more sub secrets uh, there's a complicated process but let's just say the, there's the client encryption key and the client Mac key. I think we've already explained what encryption and Mac keys are. And then there's the server encryption key and the server Mac key. So if, if the auditor steps in between the client and the server, what he can do is uh, take in the server's uh, response. Suppose the server's response says uh, $100 for Meher. And what he can do is uh, edit it. Because he's got the server Mac key, he can create not only something that's encrypted correctly, but also something that authenticates correctly and give it to the client. So the client no longer has any assurance that what he's receiving from his uh, web server is accurate. And I suppose in that scenario, that, that scenario is really bad because also it could go the other way where um, the, the auditor could step in, take the client's request and modify it and, or read it uh, and so on and so forth. Well, read it's okay because we want him to audit this particular thing. But, but generally speaking, you don't want man in the middle. You want to have the full scenario where the client is assured that only he and the server are talking to each other. Let's say that. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, I should continue. So, <laughs> so we've established a that it's not good enough to just give someone a page because they could have made it up. B, it's not really good enough for the auditor to just have all the secrets because he could then step in between and modify the the communication. So TLS Notary is trying to to avoid both of those problems. Um, so, what does it do? Well, the key to it, there are two key uh, uh, tricks to it. The first one is this. Um, the pre-master secret is converted into the, the four keys that I just mentioned in a, in a complicated process involving something called a, a pseudo-random function. But it's a special kind of pseudo-random function that's designed specifically for TLS. And um, so part of that complicated process, obviously I won't explain all of it, it'd take too long, but part of that complicated process that transfers the pre-master secret into these, what we call expanded keys, client encryption key, client Mac key, server encryption, server Mac. Part of that process is, is uses what's called uh, XOR or ZOR. You know XOR? It's a simple uh, logical operation which takes bits. So you, you, give, um, you get the exclusive OR of two bits. And um, what, what, what the, the process does is it takes two, um, within this PRF, it takes two strings of bytes and it zores them together. And I'm gonna, I'll give you an example. So suppose I had the string of, of bytes, A, B, C, D, and you had the string of bytes, E, F, G, H, right? And we know that the output that we want is the zor of A, B, C, D with E, F, G, H. So that would mean, Literally, the A gets zored with uh, what was it? E, <laughs> B gets zored with F, C gets zored with G, and D gets zored with H. So it operates like byte by byte in this sense, so actually bit by bit, but effectively the same thing. So that creates an interesting opportunity because if you've got the E F G H and I've got the A B C D, I can take the A B and just give you the A B. And you can take the, that AB and zor it with your EF, and you can get the correct output for the first half. Do you see? Right? Whereas I can withhold the CD. You don't have the CD. You only have the, the GH at the end. So you're not going to get the, the second half of the output. You've only got the first half. So that's what we exploit in, in TLS Notary. What we do is we say, right, we've got the first half of the pre-master secret. Let's say we're the auditor. You've got the second half of the pre-master secret. And although there's a lot of other complications in the middle, basically we're going to give you the bits that you need in order to create the client encryption key, the client Mac key, and the server encryption key, but we're going to withhold the bit for the server Mac key. Maybe we should just stop and think for a moment. What's the significance of that? Why is it particularly useful to just withhold the server Mac key? Right? Because the Mac key, remember, is for authentication. 
authentication. Mm -hmm. So what it means is that you can, because you've got the server encryption key, you can create a server, a page that looks like it's encrypted by the server. Mm -hmm. But the difference is you can't create a Mac that authenticates that page. Mm -hmm. So now at this stage, uh, you as the client have uh, everything you need to do the processing with the server. You, you've got the client encryption key and the client Mac key. So you create your get request, let's say, you're, you're getting an HTML page. You encrypt it and you append your Mac. You send it to the server. The server sees absolutely nothing unusual. All right? But when you get back the server's response, you can de well, we'll come back to this, but you can decrypt it, but you can't authenticate it. And you also can't authenticate it to me, the auditor. Mm -hmm. So now we have the next problem. <laughs> because if you receive a page from the server which is encrypted and you can decrypt it correctly, nevertheless, you shouldn't really use that page. Why not? Because it is not authenticated, right? Oh. Well, rather, you haven't, it is actually authenticated, but you can't authenticate it because you don't have the Mac. Key. Yeah. Yeah? So you've got this page sitting on your disk or, or sitting in memory, but you don't actually know it's from the server because it's not authenticated as being from them. So what we do is we use a commitment. We take that server response and we hash it, just using any hash function like SHA-256. We send the hash to the auditor. Now, as you know, the properties of hash functions, the, the auditor is just seeing a, a meaningless hash. He doesn't actually know the data yet. But by receiving that hash first, when he then sends us back the server uh, uh, Mac key for us to authenticate our server response and, and verify it's genuine, then we can give him the page, and it has to match the hash that we sent earlier. Do you see? Yeah. Sorry, this is a bit complicated, but I'm doing my best to go through it. So do, do you see the point that, that the, the, the sir, we're in this kind of delicate dance where the, the, the auditor doesn't want to give the Mac key to the client immediately, because then he can fabricate a page. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the client needs the Mac key to authenticate the page and know it's real. Otherwise, it could be like some hacker just sending him a page that's, you know, well, it's, let's just say. <laughs> so we're in that sort of delicate dance there. So the way we deal with that is, is with a commitment. We send a commitment of the page. We send a hash of the page to the, to the auditor. So the auditor doesn't get our page yet, but he gets a hash of it. Then when we send it later, after we do have the server Mac key, then the, the auditor just checks that the hash matches the page has been sent. If it doesn't, then the client is playing around. So that way, both sides get what they want. I don't want to. So I, I, I've ahead. got a couple of questions. On, yeah, okay. I guess more on the technical side and the practical side of it. Uh, right. Uh, I I think I understood how that works. Um, I, I will have to listen to it again though to, to really be sure about about, about sure, understanding sure. everything. No, it's very complicated. It's very complicated. especially when you you know not really familiar with you know yeah, HMAC yeah. and, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But one thing that um, and perhaps perhaps this addresses this, but. How, if, if I'm the auditor, the auditor is the person you're giving the information to and yep. who wants to verify that the information does come from a, a, a trusted, from, from a source that has yep. uh, been authenticated and created the data. Um, if I'm the auditor, how do I verify this? Am I, am I tr this, like, I'm not trusting certificate authorities to say, like, this is the actual website. Well, you are, you are. I absolutely okay. are, because you're, you're trusting the public the, the public key. You're in the same trust model as the client was originally, right? Where the client goes to mybank.com, his only assertion is that, well, the browser very, looked at the CAA list and traced the signature down. Okay, and so, this so is the correct public we're, we're key. using yeah. the certificate, uh, we're trusting the certificate authority. So yes, absolutely. Well, whatever, so if, that, if that model's broken, then you're still sort of vulnerable oh, to that. Yeah, yeah. But you're trusting the certificate and... Tr and and having authentication that the exchange of data that happened between those two parties, well, you can you can trust that that data has been authenticated. Well, let me let me go to my next question then. How okay. does a the auditor, mm -hmm. uh, what how, what are the practical ways for an, the auditor to verify that the exchange of data that happened between the server and the auditee, uh, and the client, sorry rather, uh, is is authenticated and and, and correct. And yeah, so, so that's what I, right, so that's that's kind of what that whole process does, but maybe it's not obvious why it does that, but... No, but, but practically, the, how does he do it? Like, if you send me, okay, practically, a, if you send me a page, a PDF, and, or a document okay. that, that so, you from your bank, how so, do I check it? Yeah, yeah, so so let's say we're talking about the what we might call plain vanilla TLS notary, which is where we're doing an interactive protocol. What's happening is 
the two sides, the auditor, sorry, the auditor and the client are both generating the pre-master secret together. They're generating half of each. I'll come onto that in a minute because it's a very critical technical point how that works. But they generate it together. So they have to pass um, uh, a couple of messages to each other during the handshake, during the TLS handshake. Again, I haven't got time to go through that, but that's you can imagine there's a handshake. Um, once that's set up, then the client uh, sends his request, the server response comes back, and this is the critical point. At that point, the client sends a hash of the server response to the auditor. The auditor stores that hash. Then the auditor sends the remaining material back to the client. So the client now has the full set of secrets. Then the client is back to a full TLS security model. He verifies that the page is correct, and then he sends that, let's say, HTML page to the auditor. The auditor then has uh, the HTML page and the hash. When I say HTML page, it's the whole server response and the hash, and he can verify the hash matches. Okay. Because he's, yeah. So, but, it, so I guess so the one, one question I want to ask there is, or perhaps one thing that needs to be made clear is that this only works with sort of classic vanilla HTTP requests where data is sent. It wouldn't work with, say, a page that has uh, subsequent requests like AJAX uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, coming yeah. back oh, or, or uh, JSON uh, yeah. being processed. Absolutely, and... absolutely. I, I, I want to. Well, I don't want to say absolutely it's impossible, but at the moment that doesn't work. And I, I want to sort of mention that as as one of the list list of problems. But there's just one little more kind of section I have to fill in. Otherwise, anyone listening to this knows what knows what I'm talking about is going to say that's absolute nonsense. Okay, so I have sure. to explain this one more point, which is um, in order for all of that stuff that I just described to work, you you have to have the pre master secret at the start, right? And here we've got two parties instead of one party. Usually the client generates just using a you know dev u random or whatever on his machine. He generates some random bytes, actually 48, uh, 46 bytes, and he sends them across to the server, and, and and then we're off. But what we need to do here is we need to have the pre-master secret split somehow in order for that XOR trick that I mentioned earlier to work. So the way it's done is using RSA key exchange. So. Um, I said earlier that we use public key encryption to wrap the, the secret. Um, sometimes we use Diffie-Hellman. There there's more than one way to do it. But if we use RSA key exchange, we can exploit a feature of RSA, which is that it has a homomorphism. Now, now what, what, that's a, a fancy word. What it really means, um, to keep it simple, is that if you take the RSA of one number and the RSA of another number, then their product is equal to the RSA of their product. In other words, if you took RSA of two times RSA of three, then that will be equal to the RSA of six. Now, doing RSA like that is, is completely unsafe. So people don't do that. It's called textbook RSA. Uh, it's, it's appalling to even think of using that as an encryption technique. But uh, what people usually do is they stick extra random padding bytes into their RSA messages in order to prevent uh, this from being a problem. But here we can actually use it as, as a positive. Because what we can do is take the two pre-master secret halves, the auditor has one half, and the, um, the client has another half. And with a bit of fancy algebra, we can still get the effect of the fact that them multiplying together gives us the exact format that we want to send across to the server and still have it be safe in that it has random padding. So I mentioned all that. I think it's very, an important, although highly technical, it's a very important detail because that's the only way this could work. We need to have the two parties, the client and the auditor, have some um, some of the secret data separately so that we can get this final result of, at the end of the process, uh, the, the client can have some of the keys, but not all of them. And I want to note also that the, the, the auditor doesn't have any of the keys, which is a very important technical feature as well. Today's magic word is auditor, A-U-D-I-T-O-R. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. So, so, so let me let me back up and kind of yeah. have have a like a top top view summary of of this. So, in a in a normal in a in a normal TLS connection, this is without TLS node tree. Uh, there's the client and the server. So, you know, Meher and Adam. Meher is the client, Adam is the server, right? And then Meher has two secrets. The client has two secrets, the client encryption key and the client Mac key. The encryption key is used to encrypt. The Mac key is used to create something like a signature, but it's not really a signature. It's just, it's not, yeah. it's not really a signature, but it's something which allows Meher to create a piece of data and Adam to be sure 
that that piece of data was actually created by Meher. It's something like a signature, but not a signature. It's something different. So Meher has these two keys, something to encrypt with and something to create this kind of rough signature with. And on the other you side... You can call it a checksum if you want. <laughs> checksum. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Like a checksum, right? Yeah. Or, or let's use the proper term for it, Mac. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and then, and then on, symmetrically on the other side, so the server, Adam, also has these two pairs of secrets. Uh, the server encryption key and the server uh, Mac key. Uh, by the way, both sides have all four secrets. Oh, both sides. Yeah. Both sides. Both sides have yeah. all, all four secrets. We, we could do the whole thing with just one pair of secrets, just a, an encryption key and a Mac key. But there's a technical reason I won't go into why it's better to have two pairs. Okay. So both sides have all pairs, and that's how we are communicating. Yeah. The the problem is like once we have a communication like this, it is impossible for me to prove to Sebastian that Adam sent something to me because, because Sebastian will ask the question, how do I know that these four secrets are actually the correct ones, right? Yeah. So in this case, what TLS Notary is doing is uh, it is somehow restricting the power of the client. Mm -hmm. uh, so when, when the client is actually communicating, you give him not all the four secrets, but just three of them. And one of them is... Uh, the, uh, the, the client does not have one of the secrets and only the combination of auditor and client. So Meher and Sebastian has the, in combination, the fourth secret. Yeah, let's say it's, I think the best way to understand it, because it is confusing, is that the auditor is withholding, withholding. the data necessary for that fourth secret. The, the auditor is not withholding that secret. He doesn't have it, because if he did, that would be a security problem. He's withholding the data necessary to create that secret. And, and, and because, because the auditor is withholding this, this data, so there's, there's a point in the communication where auditor is withholding this data. So Meher, then the client, which is Meher, receives the communication. And first of all, he creates a hash of the communication, like the whole communication, sends it to the auditor. Yeah. So the Meher doesn't have the fourth secret at this point. Yeah. When he sends the hash, the auditor sends some data that allows Meher to calculate the fourth secret. You've got it, you've got it. Yeah. Right? And yeah. now once I have all the four secrets, I can send the auditor the data. Yeah. And the well, the first, thing, the first thing is once you have all four secrets, you're back to f vanilla TNS, TLS you can, because you, you've got your full security model, let's say. And so then you can read the, you can read the web page, right? Because that's actually what the next thing that happens is that the, the client, suppose you're using a, a, our browser um, add-on, you would just like look at the web page at that point and you say, okay, that's, that's all right, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the auditor, so from Mayor's perspective now, it, now this is like a normal TLS connection. But from the auditor's perspective, what has happened is, uh, the auditor knows that during some part of the communication, Meher did not have all of the secrets, yet he sent me a hash of, of, of the communication. So in, in some ways, uh, Meher, uh, I have proof that since Meher did not have all of the secrets, yet he sent me a correct hash that this must be the, da the data pattern he received from the yeah. From the, the server. Effect of send, yeah, let's say the, the effect of sending the hash is to fix the server response, isn't it? You can't change it after that. And so it's fixed before you have the data that you would need if you were going to forge it. So you can't forge it without being exposed as a liar. Because, because if you try to forge it, you need to have the server Mac to make a, a valid forgery, right? Mm -hmm. So it's fixing it in advance. It's, it's called a, a commitment is the kind of general idea of, of how to do these things, yeah. Okay. Sebastian, any, any, any questions on, on this? So I want to come back to really just the, the practical side. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we verify this? Is there a tool? Is there, and, and how do we create these notaries? Can we talk about that, the, the browser plugin that you've developed? Yeah, absolutely. But I think it might be better, if you don't mind, if, if I just list it, it doesn't need to take long, but there's, there's three or four very important limitations to this. And then, and then it'll make more sense in context how we use it. So, sure. so the first limitation is, um, is that it only applies to TLS 1.0 and 1.1. And that is quite a serious, maybe the most serious limitation because at some point they will no longer be supported. Uh, we might be able to create a new version. I don't know. I, I, it, it, that's a huge topic. <laughs> uh, so that's one very important limitation. The other limitation is the, um, the fact that you were mentioning, uh, Sebastian, which is that the, uh, 
if you have like let's say a dynamic page, you're, you've got a lot of different server um, uh, client requests and server responses all kind of mingled up there, and we can't really get this commitment uh, feature that we were talking about in that context. Now, although that's a very serious restriction, and it means that this system only works for certain kinds of web pages. Uh, on the other hand, that is a restriction that might conceivably, there might be a way to get around it. It might be possible at some point with some extra engineering to, to, to get around that, but that's, that's an open question. Okay. Uh, other restrictions is restricted to RSA key exchange. And again, this is an example where we're working with something which is kind of the old version of TLS. It's still out there in the wild. It's still su supported by most servers, but at some point in the future, it won't be. So again, you know, it might require some new new technique to to solve that. Um, those were, the, I think, the three main. Oh, the yeah, the fourth main restriction is kind of maybe we've mentioned it, but it's just one server response. Now that's fine if you're just pinging an API and you're just getting one API response. But if somebody wanted to audit a whole stream of web pages, that would be a problem, right? So. Um, well, I mean, I say it would be a problem. It's probably the least significant of those four limitations because, you know, obviously you could just go back and do it again. Uh, but those are limitations. So I wanted to really emphasize those limitations because I don't want people to think this is some magic fairy dust, right? Because I've seen people saying things like, oh, wow, TLS, that solves everything. But it really doesn't, okay? It's very uh, restricted, but, it, you know, still practically could be useful in certain contexts. So, yeah, let's get on to practical applications, I agree. Um, so. Do you want me to give an example of how it might be used in practice? Yeah, yeah. How would it be used? Because there's a there's a browser plugin which the, the sure. name escapes me. Can you explain how that uh, works? Page signer. Sure. Right. So, pa pa yeah. right, page signer. Um, so we set this up, I guess, around the end of 2014 because we were thinking, well, you know, people want to actually use this. How do how is it? How can we make it easy to use? And the idea is, uh, well, no, let me not talk about the the theoretical idea. You want the practical. So the practicals is. Um, you can, there's a, a plugin, I think, for uh, Firefox and Chrome. Yeah, not I think, definitely for Firefox and Chrome. And it's basically set up so that you can just literally click, uh, you, you go to a web page. Let's say you go to some uh, private message page or some, uh, yeah, just some official web page. Uh, one, one amusing one is I, I, I verified my teacher certificate. So, <laughs> because actually the, the, the UK government has a kind of a, uh, website for that. So I, I went and I clicked a button on on the you know the toolbar, and what it does is it then reloads the page um, under the hood. It sets up a whole new TLS session for that page, uh, reloads it, and it gets represented to you. Now, when you, when the page is represented to you, you'll see it's you'll often see there's some uh, like weird formatting loss because all it's doing is just, just dumping the first server response. So if it's like get slash index.html, it's just literally giving you that. Uh, so, and we we want people to understand that. So we have a button, and you can click, and you'll see. Oh, here's the actual raw server response. Uh, and so at that point, it will create a file called a .pgsg file, which is just a binary dump of all the relevant data, including a signature. And what's going on behind the hood there is, in order to make it um, simple, uh, I had the idea maybe we should have something like a blind notary server. In other words. OK, yeah, you can do an audit with an auditor, but you'll have to do that in real time. And we, we have developed that, and you can do that. But that's kind of in if, um, inconvenient for most people, right? Interactive protocol with an auditor. So what we do is we say, right, there's a blind notary server out there. It doesn't know anything. It doesn't know the secrets. It doesn't know, uh, you know, there's no login or password or money involved or credentials or anything. All it does is it just generates half a pre-master secret, pings it over to you, waits for a hash, and when it gets a hash, it signs your response. So then anyone can see that that blind notary server has signed, you know, using this TLS notary protocol, uh, that web page. And the immediate response people have when they when they hear that suggestion is, well, then what about the trust in the blind notary server? You've got another point of trust in the in the environment there, and that's absolutely true. But we did um, obviate that or alleviate that problem very significantly by using what's called an AWS Oracle. Now, I suspect it's going to be a bit too much to go into like the details of that technology now. So, so, so this this is basically what you're saying is auditing as a service. Where yeah, that, that's that's TLS Notary as a service. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what you have set up is kind of auditing as a service where I so if I, if I'm the service provider. 
I can set up an auditor as a service business and I become the service provider. Yeah. What that allows you to do is let's say you are you are the user, I don't know Alice and you you are going to a certain web page and you want to prove to the world that you got certain data from that web page. Then you can contact me, take my services and then have some kind of of, uh, of digital proof that you did get some data from from yep. and that's a that's the business model many business people in all across the world can set up auditing as a service and maybe alice she doesn't trust just one auditor or and she can do this with like many different auditing as a service companies and then have like very concrete proof of having received something from a web page yeah it's an interesting point i mean it's a, it's a business only in as much as there's any trust involved in it um, if you try and set up the machine as an oracle, and let me let me give you like the five second version of the AWS Oracle idea. It's just a, a machine which is untamperable even by its owner. Okay, um, it does still require that you trust that Amazon's AWS service works as intended. So it's a trust point with Amazon. But basically, we set up the machine so that it can't be um, tampered. It, it can only be shut down. That's all you can do. Uh, so in that sense, it wouldn't really be a business model. I mean, I know, as you say, there are indeed already business models like that. Uh, I, I know of a few companies that are sort of based around like notarization, especially for identity, I think. But, but the way we set it up was more as an oracle so that it wouldn't really be possible. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't really have to trust it. That's the idea. I mean, you can argue whether it's true or not, but yeah. So I think Sebastian's question was, uh, what's the user experience like? Right, right. So like, like you have this video on your website. Our listeners can check it out. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a video about paid signer. And it's like it shows a set of steps people can do in order yeah. to generate a certificate of re having received a certain page. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. just explain to us what the user experience is like. Okay, yeah. So um, if your plan is to get a... a an ob let's say an objective proof that you were delivered a certain web page at a certain time. Let's say, for example, you're a trader on, I don't know, Bitfinex or something, right? And you want to prove that you had you know, a thousand Bitcoins in your account <laughs> um, and you can't get Bitfinex to actually, you know, to, well, they, they shouldn't really. That's considered private, right? So, so what you could do is you could load up your, your account page and you could just, once you've installed PageSign, you could just click the button um, on the on the toolbar, and as I said before, it will load briefly. It takes just I don't know one to five seconds. It doesn't take long, maybe maybe ten seconds. It reloads, and usually you'll see it reload uh, without formatting. I think I already said. And so at that point, what you have is a file. And if you want, obviously this is something you have to very carefully consider yourself as an individual. You can share that file with a third party, and what that file is effectively is proof as long as you believe that the AWS Oracle page signer Oracle is set up correctly it is proof that that page uh, was in fact delivered by Bitfinex up to you actually trusting Bitfinex's public key and you know if you're sufficiently technical you can check the public key in the file corresponds to the one that your browser reports for Bitfinex uh, that's actually something you can and, and I've done that yeah so does that give an idea of how it page signer at least might be used in yeah. practice yeah so i've actually tried page signer and it was mm -hmm. super easy to install like i mean the the whole tls notary concept seems complicated but like page signer was like just a breeze to install and i ended up generating proofs of having visited many websites and i oh very good yeah, yeah and, and i have these proofs and i can you know i was thinking of putting one of them on twitter you know Hey look! Yeah. Hey look! I do own five Bitcoin. You know, <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, you could brag, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, was like, yeah. But I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the, as you, if you've tried it, then you've probably seen that. You know, occasionally. I mean, it always comes up looking a bit weird. The page, right? So, uh, and sometimes it just doesn't work at all. I mean, if if the page is very, very dynamic, you might not be able to get certain data. So uh, that's one thing I should caution people. It's not. It's. Not, what, the important point there is if you're ever going to use it, please make sure it works before you use it. <laughs> and the other thing you have to be really careful about if you're dealing with sensitive data is that there could be cookies involved because this is an entire server response. And in some cases, server deliver cookies with the, uh, with the page. So you should, you should um, look at the kind of response you're getting. I mean, it depends. If it's not likely to be an issue, that's fine. Uh, we do very strongly advise people, you know, log out, right? If you're going to, if you're going to get a proof of a certain page, that's fine. But then afterwards, immediately log out so that that session cookie is no longer valid. 
it just depends on the application, but be careful. It's not just like everything's easy, right? <laughs> Let's take a short break to talk about the GTEC blockchain contest. GTEC, the German Tech Entrepreneurship Center, is a new center in Berlin for entrepreneurship and they want to support exciting projects happening in this space. So that's why they're running a blockchain contest together with RWE, which is one of the largest energy companies in Europe, and Globumbus, a foundation supporting entrepreneurship. You can participate by submitting your idea for your project and win up to $50,000 in free grant money. That's equity for you. Just take the money and do what you want with it. Uh, anybody can apply, whether you're a, a, an early stage startup and perhaps you just have an idea, a blossoming idea, and, uh, or you can apply if you've already raised funding and are well on your way to becoming the next uh, multi-billion dollar company. And anybody can apply, whether you're in Berlin and Siberia, in Shanghai, or in San Francisco, uh, there's no geographical restrictions, and anybody who applies can win up to 12 months of free office space in Berlin, uh, free mentoring, legal support, etc. Of course, that's totally optional. If you want to stay in Siberia and work on your blockchain startup, you can also do that. The application deadline is March 31st, so make sure you submit your idea as soon as possible. You can learn more about the contest and apply by going to epicenterbitcoin.com slash gtech, that's G-T-E-C. And we hope you'll win, we hope you'll make it to Berlin to collect your money and that we'll get to hang out in person. Now we would like to thank uh, GTech, RWE and Globumbus for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So, so let's get into how uh, how you can build oracles using it. And specifically, um, for our listeners, there's there's this very interesting startup called Oraclize, which is based out of London uh, by an Italian guy called Thomas Bertani. And what he has done is he has used TLS Notary in order to make a provably honest oracle, an onic an oracle that has proof. That let's say, uh, let's say there's a smart contract that needs the ether to US dollar exchange rate every 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 hour then uh, that smart contract can get the ether to ether to usd exchange rate and also a proof that the oracle is not lying about that exchange rate could you explain how thomas built it what's the what's the design behind this well the simple answer to that is no <laughs> i can't explain how uh, how how thomas uh, built it i i don't have a huge amount of knowledge about it. Um, obviously, I, I chat with him from time to time on various venues, but um, I think it's really interesting what he's doing. He's all I all I do know is he's using a combination of Ethereum with obviously for the contracts with IPFS, IPFS for the storage, and TLS Notary is one uh, way he's using to uh, provide the kind of oracle effect, the proof effect, the objective proof effect. For example, I know when he started out, he was he was using as a test case Wolfram Alpha. It's kind of an interesting example because Wolfram Alpha, you know, you can get various kinds of knowledge out of it. So he, he could just ping their API, uh, TLS Notarize the, the 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 API response, and so you know. It, it, you can imagine toy examples like weather and so on, currency and. Uh, but I, I know in recent months he's been really kind of moving forward with it. I, I've seen some examples on his his website, very impressive um, things like uh, YouTube, and I don't actually know what, how it works with the YouTube thing. But anyway, I only know in general terms, right? The general idea is that uh, he's he's using uh, a page signer style notary server. I think he might have moved from our original page signer server, which was up for like nine to, nine to ten months without going down, which we're quite happy about. <laughs> he's moved from that. I think he's built his own one, but it's the same basic design. We, I mean, all of our stuff is open source. I think he's built his own uh, AWS uh, server using the same model. But whether it's his or ours, it doesn't matter. The basic idea is when you uh, use that, you're going to generate a, a proof, like a PGSG, we call it, proof, which can then be distributed. It can be put on IPFS or, or whatever. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I can't really give you many details about Oracle. Yeah, so, so, so basically, like, it's Oracle is a service that gets, that can fetch information from, like, like Google's, uh, Google's API, Wolfram Alpha's API, or Blue, in the future, maybe Bloomberg's API. Yeah, and then it can give this information to the smart contract, but yeah. using TLS Notary, it can also certify that it actually did fetch this data from Google, and that it is not lying when it says this this comes from Google, and then the smart contract can basically t take this data from different services and maybe average that data out and have a really good 
trustworthy source of data is it's not decentralized but it's it's high throughput and it's it it is trustless to us to a certain degree I'm glad you mentioned that because maybe I don't know how much longer we've got, but I, that's one thing I really forgot to mention. I think is really interesting is when I when I wrote a blog post about this, I wrote uh, you can think of TLS no tree either as a stopgap or as a disintermediation, and the stopgap part is obvious. Like if you don't have digital signature, there's TLS no tree, but the disintermediation part is it's something that's really fascinated me for a long time. Like if you use let's say Bloomberg, like you mentioned, if you use Bloomberg to get your financial data. The trust relationship is really interesting because if you're just pinging their API and they don't even know who you are and they're this huge multi-billion dollar company and you're just like nobody, yeah, it's not decentralized. It's using their trust point, but it's using it in a way that they're not interested in it at all. And similarly with this Amazon AWS Oracle idea, we set up this silly little server. It's just it's tiny, right, on Amazon AWS. It doesn't hold any money. It's not important to anybody. Amazon doesn't care about it, but you can use it. As long as you're reasonably small, you can use it without them caring, and yet you're kind of leveraging the trust in Amazon without their permission or involvement. Um, th there's a lot of ideas like that I think are very interesting. Uh, yeah, so, so. yeah so, so what you're saying is it's like Oracle is a tiny company, but it can, it, can, it can leverage the trust network of Bloomberg saying, hey, we're getting that this, this data from this company that's been in 20 years in the business and you can trust them for good data. But like we can provide as a small company the same quality of data as them by using TLS Notary. And that allows... Yeah, I, mean, I, I, yeah. I, I would look at it like uh, imagine that you wanted to use TLS Notary to, to validate a, a $50 million contract. Well... You wouldn't really want to do that because, um, well, sorry, I don't really mean TLS notary. I mean page signer. You can do TLS notary like from person to person as an interactive protocol without any trust in any other parties apart from the, the public key of the server, right? But if you use this kind of lightweight service model, then you can you can kind of leverage trust in Amazon as long as the, 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 the well, let's say the value of what you're doing is relatively low. And also, they don't really know about it either. They, they don't know that you're using it like that. So this, these are the kind of trust models we're playing with, I think. So before we uh, wrap up here, uh, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Can you tell us where people can learn more about TLS Notary, perhaps uh, install the page signer uh, uh, extension, or even contribute to the, to the project? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so tlsnotary.org is the, is the website. Um, there's a, there's a link a link there to page signer and you can just uh, install it pretty easily. Um, in terms of contributions, uh, we we tend to hang out a lot on IRC <laughs> at uh, the TLS Notary dash chat channel on Freenode. Uh, there's obviously the GitHub repository, which is GitHub.com slash TLS Notary. There are several sub repositories. Uh, please do you know read the white paper and, and give any comments if you have on the, on the actual sort of underlying technological ideas. Uh, but that's it, really. Yeah. Cool. Anywhere else you want to send? You want to send people? Or? Uh, no, no, that's fine. If you want to contact any of us, uh, you can you can see our contact uh, details on the contacts page on the website. So just just go to the website. It's all there, really. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thanks, Adam, for coming on and being a guest on our show. Uh, it was a fascinating discussion. I mean. That Personally, I, it is it is a little bit over my head, technically speaking. I'm gonna have to listen to that again and really to really get the the grasp of how TLS works and because it is an important uh, protocol that we I use. Would, every I would day. be amazed. I would be amazed if you found that easy to understand. It took me years, so you know. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again for coming on, and to our listeners, thank you for uh, tuning in to Epicenter Bitcoin once again. We release episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. Of course, we're part of the uh, Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can go to letstalkbitcoin.com to find a whole bunch of shows about Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrencies, all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, you can get Epicenter Bitcoin on YouTube at youtube.com slash epicenterbtc if you're interested in watching the videos. Otherwise, if you want the audio version, you can get that on uh, iTunes, SoundCloud, or anywhere where you get your podcasts. Of course, if you want to leave us a tip, you can do that by uh, tipping the tip address in the show description. And if you're interested in getting one of these t-shirts, you can always just leave us an iTunes review and send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we'll send one out to you. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.